Okay, thank you uh, very much, Chris, for the kind introduction. So good morning, everyone. So we are in our second installment of this metabolomics approach and its different applications webinar series. So uh, kung hindi po kayo, if you were not able to um, watch or join us for the first session, uh, please feel free to visit the DLSU Central Instrumentation Facility uh, FB page. And from there, you will be able to watch yung first session natin uh, wherein I introduced meta the uh, metabolomics um, and its different applications. And uh, we have also heard from Dr. Maria Fe Kalingasyon on her application of metabolomics in rice research. Uh, and for today, uh, we also have uh, great stuff uh, in store for you all. Um, so last, again, last um, session, we were able to address um, the what, the why, the when, and the where of um, metabolomics. Uh, so you were um, introduced to the different possible applications of metabolomics and what metabolomics is. And so for today, we'll be covering more on the how. So uh, for this particular session, we'll cover more of the experimental um, workflow as well as the practical considerations. Uh, and in the next session on March 19, we will be covering more of the chemometrics in metabolomics. So how um, are the data analyzed in metabolomics? metabolomics. Okay, so uh, again, today we'll cover the house of metabolomics. Um, and we begin uh, by showing you ano ba yung metabolomics workflow that is involved um, in a particular metabolomic study. So first, you have to define the problem. Second, you have to set up your experimental design. Um, next, uh, of course, you will have sample collection and subsequent sample preparation, and then data acquisition. And after you have obtained the data, you will have to process the data and um, analyze uh, using statistical techniques. So dito papasok uh, yung tinatawag natin na chemometric techniques for data analysis. Uh, subsequently, after you have done your statistical analysis uh, and identified the um, features or variables of interest, you will uh, do your metab metabolite identification based on the information that you have from the um, instrumental um, instrumental platforms that you have used uh, and and less uh, and also um, your you can um, analyze uh, determine the different pathways that are perturbed using pathway analysis softwares or functionalities and lastly uh, it is um, paramount or it is of great importance also to uh, work on validations of your results from your met initial metabolomics workflow. So this, dito papasok yung first, yung mga statistical validations mo, as well as yung um, validations of the experiment, uh, making use of independent um, uh, subjects or independent uh, sample set. Okay, so um, we'll go through the details of this metabolomics workflow and uh, we'll, sh we'll show you more of like practical considerations and the things that you need to take note uh, for each step. So uh, first, the definition of the problem. So natin, what is your problem? So um, I have had discussions with possible collaborators, students before, and they will just tell me, okay, I want to do a metabolomics project. And then, okay, so ano bang metabolomics project do you want to do? So we need to go uh, further to wanting to do metabolomics. Kasi as, I've, as we've uh, stressed last week, metabolomics is mainly a tool. It is an analytical approach. And so um, it is directed towards something, towards a particular a question that has to be addressed. Kahit sabihin natin na, uh, okay, metabolomics, method development, that is still also um, directed towards a particular 
um, group of analyte uh, that you really want to analyze. So um, hindi siya uh, hindi siya yung endpoint. It is just a means to the end. Um, and so you need to identify your scientific question. So what is the scientific question that you want to address? So from the initial question, so okay, anong gusto mong gawin? Uh, you will, if somebody says, okay, I want to do a metabolomics project. So next part, anong sample? What is the sample uh, of interest? What is your, your um, subject of interest? And then subsequently, you have to ask what is the scientific question that you would want to address and what why is it relevant? So kapag sinabi natin, for example, okay, um, I want to analyze talaba, for example. Uh, okay, anong, anong scientific question they want to address uh, regarding talaba? Is it um, yung looking at the quality or assessing the quality of talaba? Um, is it assessing the possible um, uh, effects of the environmental exposures of the talaba in the different areas that it is grown, um, etc.? And bakit relevant to? So why is it relevant? So uh, dito papasok, ano yung reason why you are looking into these aspects? And then lastly, you also have to ask, can metabolomics provide the answer to your question? So is the metabolomics approach the one or the approach that can give you the answer? And also, ito lang ba yung, yung means to answer the question? Or ito lang, uh, is it sufficient enough? So in some cases, as I, as we've pointed out uh, also last week, uh, hindi, it might not be enough to just look at the metabolomics um, uh, profile. Uh, in some cases, you might need to also look at the um, other omics levels or other um, possible markers or uh, molecules of interest in order to get the big picture or the clear picture of your study. And uh, I won't go into so much details on this because next to me, we will be hearing from Dr. Mel Garcia of the La Salle Food and Water Institute. So um, yung topic niya, metabolomics is the solution, but what is the problem? This is very relevant to this particular part of our discussion. So I'll leave it up to him later uh, to um, further delve into this um, definition of the problem uh, in his own applications uh, sa coffee. So yun, um, we're looking forward to hearing from Dr. Mel. Okay, so from the definition of the problem, you go to the experimental design. So importante na ma-define mo yung problem kasi uh, dito magbabase yung experimental design mo. So in the experimental design, of course, you have to determine ano ba yung experimental setup mo. Um, then what is the sample size that you are looking into? Uh, for metabolomic studies, you need at least three uh, biological replicates. So please take note, hindi technical replicates, hindi instrumental replicates, hindi repeated injections of the same sample, but it has to be experimental or biological replicates. So at least three. Um, pero if you can have five, six, or even more, that will be much better because um, in the subsequent chemometric analysis, uh, the more the samples that you have that can represent your metabolic profile, then the more robust your um, models will be. Um, you also need to define your sample group. So dito napapasok yung mga control and treated groups mo. Uh, and if you're looking at uh, longitudinal uh, analysis, then you will have um, samples of, the, of your different groups that has to be um, uh, analyzed or collected samples from at different time points. So you need to consider that. Um, you need to determine kung ano bang approach yung gagamitin mo. Is it targeted or untargeted? So we'll define this later on. Um, and you also need to determine anong, um, anong type of quantitation. Is it quanti uh, or what type of analysis will this be? Is it quantitative analysis 
or more of a qualitative analysis or a semi-quantitative analysis, so more of relative quantitation lang. So you need to define that uh, together with determining whether you are taking your targeted or untargeted approach. Um, you also need to consider ano ba yung kailangan mong instrumentation uh, for this particular um, uh, in order to address the, the particular question that you have. So in some cases, if you're looking more at volat volatile components that are emitting or that are coming out from the biological system, uh, then of course, the more suitable um, equipment for that will be your GCMS. Uh, if you're looking at um, uh, non-volatile or uh, semi-volatile and thermally labile compounds, then of course you will have, uh, you can make use of either uh, NMR and LCM or LCMS. Uh, and actually, pwede rin naman yung GCMS with uh, the repetition, but these are things that you need to consider. Um, in some cases, you might need to make use of two or more techniques in order to give you the comprehensive profile if in case you need a comprehensive profiling of your sample. Okay, so last week we have defined your metabolomics. So we have talked about metabolomics. Uh, the term metabolome, again, was first coined by Oliver et al. when they measured the changes in the metabolite concentrations with deletion or overexpression of a gene. Uh, on your metabolomics naman was first coined by Oliver Finn. Uh, when he talked about the it being the comprehensive analysis of all metabolites in a particular biological system. Uh, and it involves identification of these metabolites and quantification. Um, subsequently, uh, actually, yun, um, medyo mas nauna pala sila. Uh, yung metabonomics was coined by uh, Nicol Nicolson et al. Um, when they described metabonomics as the comprehensive and simultaneous systematic profiling of multiple metabolite levels and their system, systematic and temporal changes caused by factors such as diet, lifestyle, environment, genetic effects, and pharmaceutical effects, both beneficial and adverse in whole organisms. So, okay, medyo mouthful yung um, definition ng metabonomics, pero uh, basically, uh, so, um, metabolomics and metabonomics have been subsequently interchanged and currently, more of you metabolomics na lang yung ginagamit natin. So, uh, to just summarize, metabolomics involves the simultaneous and comprehensive analysis of metabolites in a particular biological system under study. Other terms that you have to also take note will be, of course, your target. We, we talked earlier about targeted and untargeted. So, we have your targeted metabolomics wherein you are looking at the quantitative and semi-quantitative analysis of a few metabolites that might be of the same class or belong to the same or linked metabolic pathway. So merong, this is used if you have specific um, pathways of interest. So for example, um, if you're looking at the cysteine methionine metabolic pathway or the tricarboxylic acid pathway, then um, you can do targeted analysis of the metabolites in those particular pathways. Um, kapag naman ang targeted metabolomics, we are referring to the qualitative or semi-quantitative semi analysis of the largest possible number of metabolites from a, diverse, from a diversity of chemical and biological classes in a given biological system. So ito naman, um, it's uh, comprehensive. It's it's trying to encompass as much of the metabolic um, profile as possible. So it's trying to encompass as much of the metabolites that are present in the biological system as possible. Um, you also have what is the term metabolic fingerprinting. This is the untargeted analysis of intracellular metabolites. So looking more at um, uh, cell cultures or in vitro models um, uh, analyzing the contents of the cell after a particular treatment or looking at a particular uh, disease state um, using a targeted approach uh, is what we know as metabolic fingerprinting. On the other hand, the man, metabolic footprinting is analyzing your extracellular metabolites that are released from the cells 
into the culture media. So um, uh, we expect that if, if the cells are, are given certain treatments, um, they will release some of these metabolites either because of lysis or even because of like um, if, they, if they want to release certain signaling molecules. Uh, so um, we measure these extracellular metabolites as well uh, from that are present in the culture media. So yun naman yung metabolic footprinting. And so this is just to show you uh, an overview, like a diagram or visualization of these different approaches in metabolomics. So if you have um, a cellular or a biological system, if you're looking at the metabolome as a whole, that is, um, which is the internal, um, the intracellular contents or intracellular meta metabolites of your uh, biological system that, that is known as fingerprinting. Um, and this, again, of course, is an untargeted metabolomics approach. If you're looking at what is released uh, into the culture media or what are the secreted metabolites, this will be your footprinting. And again, this is an untargeted metabolomics approach. On the other hand, if you're looking at a specific class of compounds, like, for example, cholesterol, fatty acids, and lipids, or if you're looking at specific pathways, the metabolites of specific pathways, then that is uh, considered as metabolic profiling. So you are looking at the quantitation of specific uh, uh, metabolites or classes of metabolites. And this is considered to be a targeted metabolomics approach. Okay. So uh, it boils down to, um, in this analogy, do you want to see particular features? Do you want to see a particular, in this case, particular uh, um, group of uh, buildings of, uh, of a given type of architecture? Or do you want to see the whole scenery? So I, um, do you want to see the whole or comprehensive uh, overview of your system. So, meron tayong approach for either um, cases. Now, uh, from the experimental design, we move to sample preparation. So, ano ba yung mga considerations uh, in terms of sample pre preparations and what are the things that we need to um, uh, uh, do or take note of when we're doing the sample preparation and uh, as well as your initial collection. So, um, hindi, hindi natin mo cover everything exhaustively, but we'll give you um, um, at least the, the basics or the fundamentals in terms of like the sample preparation as well as the data acquisition. Okay, so experiment in experiment uh, and sample collection, uh, first, uh, you need to do a fast collection and stop the metabolism uh, immediately. Because in metabolomics, we wanted to capture uh, the, the metabolic profile, profile or the metabolome at the point of uh, interest as much as possible, diba? So you have to perform what we call quenching, which we, we will be explaining uh, later. Uh, and then you have to consider also, especially with plants, right? Um, uh, if you are collecting plants, there can be wounding um, as you cut, like for example, leaves, or if you cut twigs, there will be wounding during collection, and this will result in some metabolic response. And you would want to arrest these uh, wounding responses um, as fast as possible. You also need to consider the uh, to minimize the sources of variations, so such as in sample collections, yung different possible sources of variations in sample collection, um, such as in uh, if you're collecting samples like again for plants, if they are of different developmental stages, you would want to stick with one uh, um, developmental stage of like the plants. Uh, you also need to consider light period and time of collection. And even for biological samples, like for uh, biofluids, um, in the case of like human and animal models, 
um, you would expect uh, the urinal or cycle-based uh, changes in the metabolic profile. So you have to stick to um, a specific timing in terms of collection. You also need to consider yung harvest duration. So yung harvest duration naman, uh, this will be, again, for your plants, um, at what point or at what seasons are you collecting uh, the samples of, for your study? Um, in some cases, it might be advisable to if your if your um, crops or your sample or your samples are being grown throughout the year, then it might be good to like sample at different times of the year, uh, in order to obtain a more accurate profile of your um, samples. Uh, next is sample handling. So in sample handling, naman, uh, you might uh, need to consider um how the transport um the storage uh of your samples as well um how they are um collected from the site of the experiment how they are uh, stored and how they are transported and uh, how they are taken into the lab so these are different parts of the process that can also have some effect in your uh, metabolic profile. So you need to uh, minimize the sources of variations in these different steps. So as mentioned earlier, it is important to capture the snapshot of the metabolism of your sample at the time of collection. Um, just like in this picture, you, you, you kind of like throw, uh, freeze in time yung yung mga droplets that are present on the on the twigs or on the um, flowers itself uh, the same goes for um, in metabolism in meta metabolomic studies you need to like um, capture uh, the snapshot freeze in time the metabolic profile of your um, sample and actually, it can involve some freezing, very deep freezing. So when we talk about quenching, uh, again, this is to stop the metabolic activity of the sample as soon as possible from the time of collection. So usually, it makes use, we make use of like liquid nitrogen to do this. So yun talaga, if you freeze mo talaga yung samples mo in order to stop the metabolism. So, uh, but I, I understand in some cases, liquid nitrogen might not be readily available in some labs. And so you can consider also other quenching techniques. Um, of course, you can do oven or microwave drying in order to dehydrate your samples. And with that, it will also um, help stop the metabolic activities uh, present. Uh, although you have to take note that this is not suitable for thermally labile and volatile compounds. So if you're looking at thermally labile and volatile compounds uh, that you're subsequently analyzing, um, please do not use oven or microwave dry. You might need to consider other um, quenching techniques. Um, you can also consider the addition of cold solvent. So um, this is something that I usually do uh, in, in my studies previously, particularly if I'm working with um, biological samples like biofluids. Uh, so um, with the addition of solvents like, um, with the addition of certain percentage of solvents like methanol, so if you make um, yung solvent composition mo to 80% uh, together with your sample, the, your proteins will precipitate out. And this will render, uh, this will stop the metabolic activities right away kasi mag-precipitate out na yung mga enzymes mo who are um, involved in, um, uh, in the catalysis of these different uh, metabolic activities. So um, that is a common approach. Um, mo protein precipitation using methanol um, or uh, extraction and uh, with methanol chloroform or methanol with methyl tert-butyl ether um, together with water, etc. So uh, usually cold solvent, so it can be stored first in minus 20 or minus 40 
uh, and then subsequently you use that cold um, solvent for the protein precipitation. In some cases, if the above cannot be done on site, especially if you're collecting from like um, yung sa mga sampling site na medyo malayo uh, from your laboratory, uh, cold storage can help slow down the metabolism until access to the quenching methods is available. So if you can keep your samples in cold storage, like in ice box, uh, um, beef, uh, uh, in its transport to your lab, uh, then uh, that can help prevent um, uh, the it, that can slow down the metabolism. Hindi siya totally ma masa stop, but that can slow down the metabolism and. With these, it is very important to have controls, like a proper control uh, that, that will go through the same uh, process uh, in order to still be able to identify ano ba yung mga um, effects that are really relevant to your uh, scientific question. Okay, so this is just an example of like in the case of... Uh, melon samples uh, for this uh, particular illustration. Ano ba yung mga critical steps for the harvest, sampling, storage, and transport of melon samples that are prepared for analysis uh, using different techniques. So in this case, they, they analyzed yung melon samples using NMR, GCMS, and LCMS. So uh, as um, we have shown earlier, very important at the start to establish your experimental design. Uh, and then from there, uh, dito pinakita um, uh, how they have uh, uh, determined kung okay, uh, you culture your crops either in the field or in the greenhouse. Subsequently, uh, you have to harvest and you need to take note uh, ano ba yung mga harvest stage con and conditions. Um, you need to also, because at this point nga, um, at the harvest stage, when you are collecting samples, when you are collecting twigs, uh, leaves, etc., uh, the wounding can definitely uh, contribute to the metabolic changes. So you need to like limit um, this or stop uh, these types of changes as early as possible. Um, and here, uh, looking at smaller parts of the plant, then you can uh, do in situ sampling, uh, do organ deep freezing if you can bring some liquid nitrogen uh, on site. Um, of course, again, we highlight the need for um, biological replication, at least minimum of three. But if you can have uh, five uh, or more, then it will be much better. Um, and then subsequently, makakaroon ka ng transport to the lab of your samples. Uh, sa large organs naman, sa large parts of the plants, uh, you might have to do yung cleaning, sampling, and biological replication in the lab. Um, uh, you can do your tissue dissection and tissue deep freezing. And subsequently, all samples uh, would be better stored uh, in minus 80 degrees. So, um, mas na, na preserve yung metabolic profile if they are stored in very uh, low temperatures in deep freezing, such as in minus 80 degrees uh, freezer. Um, subsequently, you can do your milling, your size reduction. So, um, kasi if you're going to do subsequent extraction with solvents, it is good to reduce yung particle sizes of your sample in order to increase the surface area and to make your samples homogeneous. So, uh, you can do milling or grinding with liquid nitrogen. Uh, and this ground sample can again be stored in minus 80 as much as possible. Please, uh, you have to um, avoid. So kung yung milling mo is in liquid nitrogen, subsequently ipasok agad siya sa uh, minus 80 para hindi mag magto yung sample. Because once that uh, the samples get stored, then that's like one freeze to cycle. So um, in in yung freeze uh, repeated freeze to cycles can actually uh, also affect the metabolic uh, metabolome profile. So we have to limit that as well. Um, so yun as mentioned dito as much as possible no sample towing. Uh, do your alicoating 
before the um before the final um uh, storage dun sa minus 80 so if you can do it at this point or right after milling and trying to keep everything still very cold uh then mas much better uh kapag kasi um for example if you didn't um, alicote right away for the different analyses and then you will like um, take sample the samples in and out of the freezer um, in order to get your samples for different analyses then that will uh, you can expect that there will be uh, metabolic changes already that is not associated with your initial um, analytical uh, uh, settings or uh, in from your initial analytical uh, profiling. So yun, you have to consider uh, these aspects when we're um, doing a metabolomic study. Okay, so this is uh, again an example using plant materials. So uh, basically, after you have harvested uh, your samples, uh, you have identified, are you looking at the leaves, the twigs, the roots, etc. Um, and then you have your um, actual or specific parts of the plant. Uh, you can grind them under liquid nitrogen using mortar and pestle. Medyo mahirap siyang gawin if you're dealing with hundreds or like uh, uh, tens to hundreds of samples. So um, an alternative to mortar and pestle grinding will be, of course, if you have your cryo grinders or like your um, bead beaters. Uh, so that will be an alternative. Um, uh, then you are going to transfer um, specific amounts or specific masses of your uh, ground samples into a vial or a tube. Uh, you are you are going to have your solvent in there, your cold solvent. Uh, it can be methanol or methanol water or methanol water chloroform. So it depends on your um, uh, on your uh, on what you want to extract. So so yun. Um, kasi if you do uh, water methanol chloroform or water methanol methyl tert butyl ether, that will be what we call a triphasic. Um, um, extraction technique wherein you will have three phases. So you will have the phase of your um, uh, AQs um, extract, you will have the organic extract, and you will have um, your residues, so which, which will be your cell debris um, or plant debris, as well as your proteins that have precipitated out. So um, this will be in contrast to like the more simpler um, biphasic or uh, two-phase um, extraction where you, in you only have like, um, for example, 80% methanol. Uh, so you only have the um, extract layer and yung cell debris and protein uh, residues. So these are, uh, these samples can be, uh, okay. So this part actually is more for storage, but. Um, uh, I apologize for the confusion. So itong part na to, yung C and D are more for like um, initial storage in minus 80 degrees. So from after grinding, you transfer them to uh, tubes and then keep them in the minus 80. Uh, you can do uh, freeze drying to um, better preserve your sample. So again, this will be to dehydrate your sample to take out the water and make your samples more stable. And um, ito na, yung sinasabi ko na you can weigh a certain amount of your um, samples into the tubes and subject it to extraction using yung solvent. So it can again be yung bi biphasic or triphasic extraction uh, uh, techniques. So again, that will be dependent on what you want to cover in terms of the uh, metabolome. Um, so uh, a very common way of doing it is you add, again, the solvent into the weighed material and subsequently you, it undergoes sonication. So you can do sonication. So yung mga ultrasonic or, uh, yeah, ultrasonic bath 
that we use for cleaning our um, some of our uh, small devices or equipments. Uh, it can be very much uh, used for purposes of like extraction. Because when we do ultrasonication, nakakaroon ka ng cavitation within the um, plant materials or within your samples. And this cavitation, these small bubbles actually uh, will be uh, will be having high um, pressure and temperature within them that can uh, disrupt yung mga cells um, and allow for the extraction or the release of your metabolites into the solution. Um, and yun. So uh, it is a common way. Other methods, of course, if you have microwave uh, extraction um, devices or um, if you can do, you can even do just vortex mixing for a certain period of time. But again, that will be a bit tedious if you're doing it manually. So you, it would be good to have like some automation in place. Um, but yeah, um, for me, um, I usually make use of ultrasonic equation um, in my, uh, when I'm extracting uh, tissues, um, uh, tissue samples. Okay, so one consideration also, if you're doing sonication, please take note, the temperature dun sa sonication bath mo will increase kasi nga, uh, there is some heating involved as the sonication process uh, uh, goes uh, or progresses. So you, if you want to keep your metabolites, um, um, if you want to keep your samples cool, then it's good to also incorporate an ice bath um, para rin makatulong na hindi masyado mag-overheat or hindi masyado ma-heat up or yung samples mo. Um, okay. So, subsequently, uh, you can also consider kung hindi man sonication, uh, we also make use of those um, ball mill or bead, bead milling. So, you have your sample added to a tube which contains zirconium oxide uh, beads or silica beads. Uh, and then this will be um, put into uh, equipment that will be uh, shaking very at very high um, RPMs. And this will, uh, yung presence ng mga beads doon, yung mga collisions of the beads with your sample can actually break your samples um, and extract and allow the extraction uh, um, together in the presence of the solvent. So uh, these are this is another approach that uh, you can take in terms of like, the extraction. Um, subsequently, if you're once you're done with the extraction, usually um, we keep the samples in um, in cold temperatures, either as a fridge or as a freezer, for um, a certain period of time to aid also in the protein precipitation. Because um, di ba kapag uh, um, low temperature solubility will uh, decrease and in this case this will this will actually help in the precipitation of your protein so you can keep your samples in ice or in minus 20 degrees for about 10 minutes uh, to just help in the pre precipitation of your proteins um, subsequently you can do you can separate out your supernatant using centrifugation um, so usually you can set it at high speed uh, in order to separate out your uh, cell debris and residues and protein precipitates from your supernatant. So usually around 14,000 RPM in a small um, benchtop centrifuge. If you have refri refrigerated centrifuge, that will be much better so that you ensure na hindi nag heat up yung samples mo as it undergoes centrifugation. So um, these metabolites are, of course, stable uh, kasi yung normal body temperature naman natin is uh, at 37 degrees. So um, anything uh, below that will be good. Kapag more than that, medyo uh, we, we might expect like some possible effects in terms of the uh, metabolites. So, so yun. So if you have refrigerated centrifuge, much better. Kung wala naman, then you might consider having to um, decrease the time that you do the centrifugation. So pwede na um, decrease the time and then do it twice. Um, pero meron kang parang cool down phase 
uh, in the middle. So that's one uh, approach to that. And then once you have the supernatant, uh, in this case, it was subjected to NMR analysis. So um, right away from the supernatant, you can uh, transfer it to an NMR tube and subject it to NMR measurements. Uh, for LCMS analysis, the same can be done. Yung centrifugation mo can help to uh, prevent, uh, can already help uh, um, separate out um, small particles from your, uh, from your extract. And uh, with that, pwede mo actually, pwede mong directly inject sa, sa LCMS system mo. But there can still be risks of um, clogging of your columns. So if it, um, it's still advisable to make use of your um, uh, filters. So at least 0.45 micron or if you have 0.2 micron filters uh, before you do your, uh, before you inject the samples into the LCMS. Um, yung sa GCMS naman, uh, this one you'll have to see kasi uh, you, you might still need to do uh, derivatization uh, for your samples before you do your uh, GCMS. So, as mentioned here, similar yung workflow up to for MS-based metabolomics up to I, point I, and then subsequently magkakaiba na lang um, as, it sub, at it sub, as it is subjected to either NMR, LCMS, or GCMS analysis. Um, for solvent extract, if solvent extraction is done at the onset and the immediate instrumental analysis cannot be performed, the supernatant after centrifugation can be obtained and dried before the freezer storage. Kasi in some cases, uh, for example, if you're looking at longitudinal analysis subjected to LCMS or GCMS um, analysis, uh, kasi yung GCMS and LCMS can be prone to batch effects. So if you analyze your samples at different times, makikita mo the possible na yung, yung nakita mo differentiation of your samples might be due just to uh, effects of the difference in time in analysis. So in order to avoid that, uh, it is advisable to analyze your samples at the same time. So ang ginagawa namin usually, especially for looking at large cohort studies, we do the extraction in batches wherein hindi kami nagsa-stop at taking at the supernatant. So after taking the supernatant, we subject the sample or the extract to drying, uh, pwedeng drying using nitrogen gas or drying using um, um, yeah uh, um, using vacuum centrifugation or speed vacuum uh, centrifugation. If your if your sample is mainly an aqueous extract, you can use freeze dryer. So once that is in dried form, it is again. Uh, stable and can be kept in the minus 84 storage uh, until it is time for you to do the analysis. So that's an approach um, that we also usually take uh, when we're dealing with large amount of samples. Okay, in terms naman ng biofluids, yung mga biological fluids like uh, in this case urine and plasma, serum, um, as well as other biofluids that is often used in clinical metabolomics like uh, ce cerebrospinal fluids, um, sputum. Uh, I think right now we're already also seeing applications of, uh, of metabolomics to saliva um, and etc. There's a, a currently almost the almost different Dif the, all the different types of uh, fluids or samples that can be obtained from biological systems are already being subjected to analysis. So, dito na rin papasok yung mga tissue samples mo. Um, and yun nga, yung mga biofluids, urine, CSF, uh, BALF, like bronchoalveolar lavage fluid, um, sputum, saliva, uh, blood, of course, that one is a very common um, uh, sample for clinical metabolomics, um, sweat, meron na nang analyze ng sweat. Uh, si Sir Rod, he's looking at the metabolome of milk, so very interesting. Uh, so yun, 
So there is a lot of different factors that can also affect these different biofluids. So for this uh, particular application, uh, for this particular session, we'll just give you a glimpse of like uh, what are the factors that can affect the metabolome ng urine at saka ng uh, blood. Uh, so in this case, we're going to obtain either plasma or serum. Okay, so as you can see from the different stages ng um, sample preparation prior to your metabolomic analysis, um, there's a lot of steps there are, uh, that can be, and there are different factors that can be affected in these different steps. So looking first at your um, blood, so yung choice of collection tube, um, certain collection tubes will have like different coatings and this can affect uh, your metabolites. Either they can be like, um, they can be capturing your metabolites from your solution or they can be a source of contamination uh, for in the subsequent steps. Um, if you're looking at plasma, so distinction natin, uh, plasma and serum. So serum is um, um, yung component of the blood that is obtained after it is allowed to coagulate. So after, um, ito yung uh, ina-allow natin mag-coagulate yung um, supernatant. So um, initially, you will subject your blood sample to centrifugation. Of course, you will have your uh, cells in the, in the residue and then you have a supernatant and this supernatant will can be subjected to um, so it, if it is allowed to coagulate so must separate mo yung supernatant from your coagulating factors or other cells um, uh, and other components and uh, yung yung serum will be the supernatant on the other hand man kapag hindi mo inallow na magcoagulate yung yung um, yung, yung component na yon yung supernatant na yon uh, and it is put in in it is put in collection tubes that has that is coated with certain anticoagulants like citrate, heparin, uh, EDTA. So ang tawag naman doon is plasma. So um, yon so if it's not coagulated, uh, plasma yun na obtain natin. So again, this choice of like which um, anticoagulant that is used, they can also affect your metabolic profile. Um, so actually, yung heparin, EDTA, um, they can be used. Uh, yung citrate, medyo may problema tayo doon kasi citrate is a metabolite. And so if you're looking at uh, metabolites that are like, for example, citric acid and related metabolites, then... Uh, yung levels of your um, uh, citrate in your anticoagulant can be a problem because they're the same. They are actually present in your uh, metabolome profile. Um, you also need to consider ano ba yung sampling device. Is it a vacuum uh, sampling device or aspirated? Ano ba yung sampling site? Is it a venous uh, blood? Um, or is it collected from the artery? Um, in terms of the sample processing, yung clotting time serum, for the serum uh, can, is, a, is an important factor. Of course, if there is differences in clotting time, and actually uh, for different individuals, the clotting time can be different as well. So this can be a source of variation. Um, centrifugation, of course, um, if you subject kasi yung um, blood to uh, very high speeds of centrifugation, then this might actually lyse yung cells. So once the cells are lysed, so maapektuhan na nun yung metabolic profile mo uh, nung plasma or nung serum. Kasi kumbaga, um, hindi na lang siya um, uh, metabolic profile of your plasma and serum, pero nakasama na rin doon yung profile nung red blood cells mo, for example, or your white blood cells. So you need to be careful with that. I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's 3,000 uh, G for uh, centrifugation for like um, this initial part of centrifugation if you're trying to separate out your um, serum or plasma from your, uh, the rest of your blood components. Uh, and of course, uh, in some cases, there can be homolysis. So if your samples already has uh, 
if um, there is already hemolysis in your sample, then you might have to consider uh, not including those samples in your study. And yon time delay and temperature. Again, this um, your 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 metabolome changes very fast. So I think it will be in the range of uh, hundreds uh, of milli, milli, millimolar or tens of millimolar per second. So um, you need to be careful uh, to limit uh, as much as possible time delays. And if you can uh, keep your samples in cold storage during this whole time of like collection and processing, that will be much better. That will help slow down the metabolism and preserve your sample. Um, and yon, alicoating and transport. So again, especially for biofluids, um, it is good to do your alicoating before you subject them to long-term storage, such as your minus 80 or minus 20 or 4 degree storage. So for long-term storage, um, usually up to about, you can store it up to about one year. Uh, you can store in minus 80 for short-term storage of just a few days to a few weeks, uh, you can keep it in minus 20 or minus uh, in four degrees. But again, yeah, you have to consider, um, I think yung urine can be um, kept in four degrees up to about 48 or 72 hours. So um, that will not be an issue. Uh, but uh, yeah, possibly in the case of plasma or serum, it might be better to keep them uh, if they're, um, it might be better to uh, do the cold extraction right away, uh, dry them, and then keep them for long-term storage. Um, okay, so uh, in the case naman ng urine, uh, collection drugs, again, the additives that are present in the collection drugs will affect um, your, it might affect your mo profile. Um, sampling modes, uh, you have to consider, are you going to do spot sampling, time, 24 hours? So again, this is because um, there are changes in the metabolic profile uh, based on the, uh, yun, um, at different times of the day, the metabolic profile um, can be different for a particular person. So, um, and then you have to uh, consider uh, is the sample collected midstream or first void. So as much as possible, collect from the midstream. Um, so mass consistent, mass reproducible yung sample that is obtained from midstream. Uh, and um, sampling time, yon. So again, consideration of like when it is collected. So um, usually it's uh, advisable to do the collection in the morning. So that will be more reflective of your nutritional, um, I think your nutritional um, status. And uh, ayun. So kumbaga, uh, kasi yung mga activities uh, during the day, um, your level of dehydration during the day, your, your level of hydration during the day will be affected. Uh, so um, it is good to like uh, consider uh, collection from uh from morning uh, in terms of like urine. And then again, also centrifugation, uh, you have to consider the speed of centrifugation as uh, very high speeds can lyse cells that are present in your, in your urine, uh, including yung mga uh, cells that are coming from uh, your bacterial cells. So there can be bacterial cells present in the urine and this can also lyse and be incorporated into your urine profile. Um, it is good to do filtration. So 0.2 micron filtration will be a good step uh, to help preserve your sample. So Marie, remove muna. With 0.2 mic micron filtration, you can remove most uh, bacteria that might be present in your sample. And you can then subsequently store uh, your samples um, uh, for longer term. Uh, you can consider adding preservatives or bacteriostat agents like um, boric acid and azide, sodium azide. Uh, but if you can, um, um, if you can do without them, it's actually also better, especially with boric acid because that can affect your pH, of course. Um, and then yon, uh, when we talk about same thing, it can be stored long term in minus eighty, short term in minus twenty or four degrees. Um, 
towing again as much as possible limit freeze tow cycles. Okay, so these are just some recommendations for the um, standardizing of the pre-analytical phase in blood and urinary metabolomics. So they have suggestions. You can check out this um, um, paper. Uh, so they are the ones who presented those pre-analytical factors that can be affected. And these are uh, their recommendations in terms of like what you can do in different at the different steps. So in sample collection, so as mentioned here, yung um, ano ba yung suitable na anticoagulant. As mentioned, citrate tube should be avoided. Um, sampling time, so all samples must be collected within the same time lapse under the similar fasting status and other confounding uh, conditions. So as much as, as much as possible with limited um, physical activity muna. Kasi any physical activity can actually affect also the metabolic profile of your subjects. Um, and yun, uh, sampling material, kung ano yung ginamit mo with regards to the sampling material, it's, it's advisable to make use of the same uh, brand and manufacturer, same brand or manufacturer of your sampling devices, collection devices uh, throughout the entire study kasi the, the minor uh, change in uh, brand of like centrifuge vials or, or, or your collection vials can actually affect um, the profile of your samples. Um, also, as mentioned here, yung mga um, aspects such as yung effects ng centrifugation and or filtration. So as much as possible, uh, avoid um, high speeds uh, centrifugation if you're trying to separate out your um, plasma or urine or serum samples from your cells kasi nga um, lysis can happen if you do uh, high speed centrifugation um, as much as possible here as mentioned uh, try not to use uh, preservatives in the blood because again uh, there might be effects in your metabolic profile um, for uh, urine, you can make use of sodium azide or boric acid, uh, but more advisable sodium azide. Um, quenching, uh, you can do snap freezing in liquid nitrogen, but not dry ice. This is for liquid samples kasi um, dry ice is carbon dioxide, diba? So um, it can solub solubilize in your samples. And once it's solubilized in your samples, it can affect the pH of your samples. So uh, you have to take note of that as well. Um, yon, sample alicoating. So it's advised to do sample alicoating before, um, before uh, keeping it for long-term storage uh, in order to avoid the frequent freeze towing. So if you can, if you already know how much samples do you need per uh, type of analysis or per type of extraction. So you can keep alicots of that in your small vials already. And subsequently, once you are ready to do your extraction, so kukuha ka lang dun. Okay. Uh, in terms of sample transport, so samples must be transported after pre-processing, alicoting, and freezing whenever possible. So cold temperature shipment is definitely uh, better or um, is strongly recommended in order to avoid um, yung mga metabolic conversions. Uh, sample storage, ayun, so up to minus, for one week, up to minus 20 degrees. Long term, of course, will be using your minus 80. Um, ayun, try to avoid sample freeze towing cycles. So limit yung freeze tow cycles. Okay, so that is for your sample prep. Um, you can also, in the case of, um, okay, in terms of untargeted metabolomics, we don't usually perform so much of these um, cleanup steps kasi nga, we try to cover as much of the um, metabolome as possible. In some cases, these cleanup steps can actually capture some of the metabolites of interest. So, um, medyo limited yung cleanup steps when we're doing untargeted. But if you're doing targeted analysis, you want to focus on specific um, compounds of interest or like even exogenous uh, metabolites, yung mga metabolites ng mga drug um, drug treatments mo or um, pollutant exposures mo, 
So you might uh, consider doing some cleanup in order to enrich your sample and to remove um, other interferences. Uh, so yun. So you can make use of solid phase extraction or solid phase micro extraction. So this one will be a smaller scale uh, of your solid phase uh, extraction, yes. And um, this can help pre-concentrate or enrich your sample prior to analysis. So there are different modes. So it can be fiber, sample flow-based, uh, vessel walls can be coated with the sorbent or adsorbent material. Um, you, it can also be suspended on particles. So it can be coated on suspended particles. It can be on the stirrer. So uh, a development of this will be your stir bar uh, microextraction, uh, stir bar sorptive microextraction technique. Um, it can also be on disc or membrane. Um, it can also be um, for volatile organic compounds. It can also be uh, um, used in the headspace. So you have your headspace SPME setup for the capture of volatile organic compounds for your samples. And subsequently, this can be directly injected into the GC injector port where it will be where there will be desorption of your vol volatile organic compounds and subjected to GCMS analysis. Okay, um, next, after the sample preparation, we go to uh, data acquisition. So data acquisition, dito na papasok yung mga instruments na ginagamit natin uh, for analysis. So this one I've shown you previously. So in metabolomics, uh, these are the different instrumentation that we usually use. So you have mass spectrometry-based um, techniques. You have NMR spectroscopy. And these spectroscopy, your IR, NIR, and Raman, are commonly used for purposes of um, meta metabolic or metabolite fingerprinting. Uh, pero in terms of like uh, being able to uh, determine um, kung ano ba talaga yung meta metabolites that are changing and what are the pathways affected, uh, you need to be able to know ano yung metabolites. And for that, yung NMR and MS-based techniques will be much more suitable um, as compared to using yung mga um, IR, NIR, and Raman. So uh, under MS-based, uh, you can do direct injection or flow injection, or currently you have your um, ambient uh, ionization or yung mga direct ionization uh, modes in terms of like mass spec. So these are also other options. Uh, you also have your couplings with different separation techniques such as LC, GC, and CE. Um, and we'll try to discuss more on yung LC and GC uh, later. Okay, so um, there is no single instrument that can cover the whole metabolome. Uh, for example, uh, mostly uh, if you talk about GCMS um, analysis, ang um, cover ng GCMS will be about um, 30 to around 30% of the small molecules. Kasi nga, um, you have to consider that uh, in GCMS analysis, it mainly covers um, thermally stable as well as um, volatile components. Of course, there are configurations that can help you analyze um, uh, thermally labile um, components and non-volatile components. Of course, you can do derivatization in order to allow you to analyze some of the non-volatile components, but there are still some limitations to that. So um, on the other hand, the man, yung GC, uh, yung LCMS can only can mostly cover more of your non-volatile, semi-volatile components, and um, they are uh, more suited for thermally labile. Yung NMR, they can, it can cover a whole range of different metabolites, pero meron kang konting uh, disadvantage in terms of like how sensitive it is kasi uh, medyo mas mababa yung sensitivity ng NMR compared to like your mass spec techniques. So meron siya kanya-kanyang advantages and disadvantages. And so uh, no single instrument can actually cover the whole metabolome. And you would usually need to use um, complementary platforms to maximize the metabolite coverage. So for example, your if you can do a combination of LCMS, GCMS, you can do NMR, uh, LCMS, uh, you can do NMR, GCMS. So depending on the coverage that you want. 
um, in my application, um, previously, we made use of NMR for the more polar metabolites. Um, and actually also, um, doon sa LCMS side, we made use of two different um, separation techniques, yung reverse phase and hydrophilic interaction uh, chromatography to allow us to cover yung mga both yung mga polar as well as yung mga uh, non-polar and mid-polar um, components of the um, samples. Now, okay, so this is just, I, I just wanted to use this illustration to show you na, okay, if you're taking uh, pictures of, during the F1 race, so if you do not have the right gear um, and the right settings, ito yung mga kuha mo. Whereas if you have this, the right gear, the right settings, the proper, um, you're aware of how to shoot um, this properly then you would have uh, an amazing picture like this. So, importante that you make use of the right equipment, you make use of the right settings, and you have um, sufficient know-how uh, in order to um, capture uh, your, the snapshot of your metabolic profile. So, nilikan ko dito kasi syempre yun nga, mabilis yung changes in, metabolic, in the metabolic profile. And so, you have to really have the right gear, the right settings, the proper know-how in, in order to really capture your uh, metabolic profile accurately. Um, so, differentiating your NMR and MS-based metabolomics. So, ano ba yung advantages, disadvantages of NMR, uh, LCMS, and GCMS for metabolomic analysis? So, in terms of sample preparation, medyo mas madali yung NMR kasi you only need to dilute your sample uh, for liquid samples. You only need to dilute them with deuterated solvent. For solid samples, there will be some extraction involved. But again, if you do it with deuterated solvent directly, pwede mo nang subject yung supernatant to analysis. Um, sample preparation for GCMS, uh, if you do headspace analysis, you don't need to do much kasi you can just put your samples in a vial um, and then merong heated incubation naman dun sa instrument if you have a headspace analysis uh, module. And uh, from there, it can already obtain your volatile component. So direct na. Um, in some cases, you also need to do extraction with um, your volatile organic solvents and yun yung i-inject uh, into your GC. And yun, in order to analyze our um, relatively non-volatile components to increase your coverage, you, you might need to do derivatization. So dito papasok yung derivatization mo with BSTFA to, uh, in order to silylate your sample or um, the use of fatty acid, uh, um, derivatization of your fatty acids to methyl esters, um, etc. In LCMS, you might need to do desalting and filtration. Um, and yun, extraction with organic solvents. So sensitivity, as I've mentioned, medyo at a disadvantage ang NMR. Unless, of course, I think if you make use of um, cryogenic traps or cold traps, then that might increase the sensitivity. But relatively, compared to your LCMS and GCMS, medyo mas less sensitive siya. So yung um, detection limits is only up to the micromolar to millimolar range, whereas MS base will be picomolar to micromolar. Quantification, um, GCMS and LCMS, uh, kailangan mo na mga standards, whereas yung sa NMR, hindi kailangan. So you can make use of your internal standards that you incorporate, uh, such as yung mga TMS, TSP, or other internal standards. And these uh, can be directly used for quantitation kasi linear yung response. And uh, in terms of reproducibility, as I mentioned, um, GCMS, LCMS uh, can be uh, subject to batch effects, um, uh, whereas yung NMR has very high reproducibility, hindi siya usually affected if you analyze your samples in different batches or different days. Um, Runtime, uh, usually greater than 10 minutes uh, for both LCMS and GCMS, and this can uh, extend up to about an hour. NMR usually takes about 5 to 20 minutes. The cost for um, analysis is usually higher uh, also for GCMS and LCMS kasi 
uh, relatively instrumentation and uh, maintenance costs also ha is higher for both uh, as compared to NMR. Um, although you have to factor in yung mga refills of the cryogen for NMR, pero um, in terms of the actual number of uh, time for usage, as you can see, medyo mas mababa siya. So less yung time that you need to pay for uh, if you're doing per hour charging or ayun. Um, in terms of like uh, tissue samples, yun nga, uh, depende sa compounds that you're looking into, you might require derivation for uh, GCMS with um, LCMS, kailangan din extraction. NMR, most likely kailangan din extraction, but if you have a uh, setup for magic angle spinning NMR, then do, you can do direct analysis. Um, specific advantages for GCMS will be the sensitivity and the availability of standard library. So yung mga NIST library mo, from where you can, um, which you can use to identify um, your compounds and the, the NIST library has a lot, has thousands of compounds um, that you can use for identification. So in terms kasi ng ionization ng GCMS, uh, it's very reproducible, um, particularly yung electron ionization. So the NIST libraries and most of the libraries will be based on electron ionization at 70 electron volts. And definitely this can be comparable across different instruments. And so pwede mong gamitin yung uh, libraries to determine the identity of your compounds. Uh, sa LCMS naman, also sensitivity is an advantage, selectivity and specificity of detection also, and the higher number of detectable molecules kasi nga um, LCMS compared to GCMS uh, in terms of the um, molecule coverage, medyo mas madami siya. Um, there is no need for derivatization. Um, on the case naman ng NMR, it is a non-destructive sampling technique. Um, it is pro it can provide you good replication, high reproducibility, and it gives you structure information. Although, of course, um, LCMS, GCMS will also provide you with some um, structure information based on its mass to mass. Ah, sorry, MSMS fragmentation patterns. Um, specific disadvantages for your GCMS, of course, in some cases, the derivatization can be tedious. Um, it is a destructive detection technique. It is not suitable for thermally label and non-volatile compounds. Of course, again, there can be configurations or modifications in your method that can be arranged to allow to uh, further expand your coverage. Pero yun, uh, medyo may additional um, configurations needed. And um, for both mass spec based, for any mass spec based techniques, your compound has to be ionizable. So it's either it has to be inherently ionizable or you convert it um, into something that is ionizable, again, using derivatization. So on the other hand, man, in terms of NMR, one of the concerns nga is the low sensitivity. And if you are looking at uh, specific classes of compounds, for example, sugars, um, there can be signals that are highly overlapped. So, and so, medyo mahirap na siya indistinguish. You might have to resort to like um, 2D NMR in order to like distinguish them. Uh, but it's a very useful tool if you want to get an overview of your metabolites that are present in the sample. So this is, uh, again, in NMR metabolomics, actually, the proton is the nuclei of choice for metabolomics. Although you can make use of your phosphate, your um, your carbon, your nitrogen, uh, pero kasi in terms of abundance and uh, ubiquity, uh, mas um, preferred yung uh, proton kasi with that you can get um, high um, intensity signals even if you don't make use of too many scans. Uh, if you make use of carbon-13, the carbon-13 abundance, natural abundance is low. Uh, then you will have to use very high concentrations of your samples as well as um, higher number of scans in order to get um, a good spectra. So sa proton, walang problema. The metabolites can be identified uh, from database or literature based on chemical shift and multiplicity. So this is an example of the proton NMR spectra of green tea. Um, so yung green tea, that's green tea that is extracted in the SS. And you can see 
um, that you are that you will be able to identify a whole range of different metabolites that are present in your sample. Uh, so as mentioned, it can provide you a bird's eye view of the different molecules that are present in the sample. Um, here we're showing magic angle spinning NMR. So ito is sinasabi ko that you can use for um, uh, you can use it for uh, tissue samples, so direct analysis of your tissue samples. So it al allows high-resolution NMR analysis of intact tissues. So this is important if you wanted to study the compartmentalization of the uh, metabolic profiles in tissue. Kasi diba, for example, in, ki in kidney, so meron kang iba't ibang different types of cells that are present in different parts of your kidney. And so if you want to really um, mix, uh, really profile specifically these different parts, then uh, magic angle spinning NMR will be a good approach uh, to these types of studies. So yun, since magic angle, so it makes use of uh, the magic angle of 54.7 degrees in terms of the tilt of the sample. Um, and this reduces the line broadening effects uh, that are usually present when you're analyzing tissue samples. So this is quite straightforward. So you just put your sample inside this um, tube. Uh, so about one millimeter cube of sample. Um, and then you add a bit of deuterated solvent. So about um, 10 microlit of solvent. And then, ayun. So you have to put it inside the probe. Um, and then uh, you can detect um, your different metabolites. So this is an example of um, the analysis of a pig liver tissue that is analyzed using a 600 megahertz NMR with magic angle spinning. So you can see uh, the profile of different um, groups of um, or classes of metabolites uh, using this approach uh, that is present in your pig liver tissue. Um, in terms of mass spectrometry in instrumentation, I'll quickly go through this because I'm running out of time. So. Um, uh, first, you have the inlet that introduces the sample into your mass spectrometry system. Uh, and then your um, analytes are ionized in the source or in the ionization source. And then they are subsequently subjected to separation or filtering using your mass analyzer. So this is based according to your, their mass to charge ratio using magnetic or electric field. Um, then your detectors will count the ions that produces the signal of your separated ions. And you, of course, have your instrument control and data system present in your, uh, per, uh, in your PC uh, for uh, the, the control of the instrument and the recording of the signals. Um, and this system, the mass spec is usually in under high vacuum. So in some setups, the source might not be under the vacuum anymore. So this will be in the case of your atmospheric pressure ionization. So hindi na siya naka vacuum, but in other uh, setups, this will still be part of your vacuum uh, chamber. So yun. Um, so, okay, so vacuum system, it's important for minimizing ion molecule reactions, scattering and neutralization of ions. Okay, in terms of choice of ionization technique, um, there are your, in GCMS, it will be mainly your EIN, electron ionization and chemical ionization. LCMS will be your APCI, atmospheric pressure, photo ionization, ATPI or, and APCI, yung chemical ionization counterpart niya, and also electrospray ionization. Um, in MALDI MS, of course, you have your MALDI uh, ionization. So as you can see, in terms of coverage, uh, most coverage can be afforded making use of ESI uh, for LCMS. Uh, you have different mass analyzers. So after the ions are formed, the ions are accelerated into the mass analyzer, and they are separated according to their mass to charge ratio. You have two types of analyzers, your continuous analyzer, such as your quadrupole filters and your magnetic sectors and your pulsed analyzer, such as your time of flight and ion trap. Um, some important terms that you will usually hear in mass spectrometry. Uh, first is resolving power, the ability of a mass spec to separate adjacent ions and your mass resolution. So um, 
this is a measure of your resolving power. So it is measured uh, if you take your peak mass uh, and divide it by the full width at half maximum. So this will be your full width at half maximum. And as you can see, uh, a high resolution MS will have a very uh, small full width at half maximum compared to your quadrupole that has a high um, um, full width at half maximum. And so from here, you can see na kapag sinabi natin high resolution, definitely with the, with the narrower peaks or the narrower signals, you will be able to separate adjacent ions better. Uh, mass error and mass accuracy. So uh, it's a measure of the ac accuracy of the mass information that is provided by the mass spec versus the two exact mass. Um, you can get the mass error by subtracting your measured mass from the theoretical mass and your mass accuracy by dividing the mass error with your theoretical mass uh, multiplied by 10 to the 6. Uh, monoisotopic mass is also known as your exact mass, which is the atomic mass for each at um, the, um, um, the, the molecular weight wherein the atomic mass for each atom is based on the highest abundance isotope for that atom. So, yun. Um, this is a comparison of the different mass analyzers. So, um, you have your quadrupole, you have ion trap, you have time of flight, magnetic sector, um, Fourier transform, ion cyclotron, resonance, MS, your orbit trap. So they have different differences in terms of like mass limit, resolution, um, mass accuracy, ion sampling. So you have those that are considered high resolution MS. So that will be your TOF reflectron, magnetic, FTI, ICR, and orbit trap. Um, very commonly used in terms of tandem mass spectrometry or the combination of two mass analyzers for um, tandem uh, MS will be your triple quadrupole. Of course, there are also combinations of uh, quadrupole TOF or quadrupole TRAP, uh, et cetera. Uh, in terms of like tandem mass spectrometry also, um, okay, I'll go into the next slide. So when we talk about tandem uh, MS, it is a process in which the initial mass analyzer selects a parent ion or precursor ion and subject it to fragmentation. And subsequently, the fragments or the product ions are then mass analyzed by a second mass analyzer. So that will be mainly tandem in space. So you have two, two different mass analyzers. You can also have a tandem in time, which is your ion trap. So yung ion trap kasi... Um, from the term itself, it can trap the ions, uh, and then in that one trap, kailang pwede niya ma isolate or ma filter out the rest of the ions, fragment one, uh, fragment one ion, and subject it for subsequent uh, detection. Uh, kapag sinabing tandem in space, yun nga kailang mo ng at least dalawang mass analyzers. Uh, so MSMS is the experiment performed using tandem instruments, and they are called MSMS experiments or tandem MS experiments. Uh, product ions will be the fragment ions formed after CID or collision-induced dissociation. Um, you have your parent ion, which is or your precursor ion, which is the initial ion that is selected by the first mass analyzer, and that which will be subjected from fragmentation. So this is just to illustrate. Uh, so from uh, in tandem in space, tandem in space setting, such as in the case of a triple quad or triple quadrupole, um, initially you will have um, uh, in the you have in it, you have a few ions that will be filtered uh, uh, from which your Ma plus will be filtered, and this Ma plus can be subjected to your fragmentation, and the Q3, your second quadrupole, will will allow for the scanning of, um, uh, of these different um, ions. Or in some cases, if you're looking at multiple reaction monitoring, from these different fragments, the, third, the second quadrupole can actually um, filter off the others and just specifically um, send off for detection one of the ions. So Q1, Q2, Q3, na triple quadrupole, but actually, Quadrupole mass analyzers are only your Q1 and your Q3. Yung Q2 is a collision chamber. 
Uh, this is an example of tandem in time. So in the case of ion trap, so again, uh, if it will initially trap your ions, select a particular ion to stay inside the trap and then subject it to fragmentation and this subsequently can be detected. Uh, again, this is just to illustrate the tandem MS in space um, setting. Um, these are the different acquisition modes that you can do in uh, mass spec. So you can do scan. So that means all the, all the ions in a particular mass range can be scanned and sent to the detector. You can have selected ion monitoring for single mass analyzers, wherein you can select specific ions that will be um, subjected for detection. Uh, in tandem, MS, uh, tandem in space MSMS, you have a bit more uh, different types of acquisition modes. You can have product ion scan. That means a particular ion can be subjected to fragmentation and all the ions will, all resulting ions will be scanned. Selected reaction monitoring, a particular ion is selected for fragmentation and only specific um, fragment ions will be detected. So mass, mataas yung selectivity niya or specificity. Um, neutral loss, only those um, ions producing a particular loss of this structure will be detected. And precursor ion scan is uh, it will select the fragments um, that are produced from this particular group of um, uh, ions. Um, so usually, yun nga, um, MS is coupled with mass spec. So it can provide you structural and mass information. So especially in the case of um, QTOF, for example, you obtain high resolution uh, MS spectra and high accurate mass. So you can make use of the mass information for identification. Fragmentation that can be coming from your EI, electron ionization in the GC side, or in your subsequent MSMS for LCMS or uh, GCMS uh, configurations can also provide you with uh, structural informations that are useful for identification. And if you combine these in the case with uh, GCMS with retention time index information, uh, then you can have very reliable identification when you're using your compound library. So this is just to illustrate the three-dimensional nature of uh, GCMS or even LCMS data. Um, okay, so some requirements for GCMS hyphenation of course, um, you need to make sure that your um, analytes are volatile and thermally stable and ionizable. Um, I won't go too much through so much details with the other um, aspects, but um, GCMS can be actually directly coupled with MS kasi nga nasa volatile state na yung ions mo. Um, this is just to illustrate the different GCMS components so you can see the direct coupling of your GC with your mass spec. Uh, these are some of the mass analyzer configurations that you can have. Um, I've personally used uh, GCQTOF, GC Triple Quad, as well as the GCMSDC system at CIF. Um, LCMS hyphenation, so it can be analyzed for a diverse range of, of non volatile compounds, um, including those of high molecular weights and polarities. Um, but main requirement is that the eluent and the components of the eluent must be from the LC must be volatile. So this includes your mobile phase and additives. So usually, um, yun, uh, usually ginagamit yung mga organic, sol organic solvents like methanol, acetonitrile, and yung mga um, additives mo will be also volatile such as your formic acid, acetic acid, ammonium formate, um, ammonium acetate, etc. So these are some of the instruments that I have worked with in terms of LCMS system. So uh, this is the HPLC QTOF at CIF. These are my previous babies when I was working in Singapore. Uh, this is an HPLC QTOF system as well as a UHPLC QTRAP system. So uh, QTOF is mainly for high resolution um, mass spec. And this is QTOF or any high resolution mass spectrometry setups is mainly used for untargeted analysis. Of course, they have also capabilities for um, targeted analysis. There are certain cap capabilities for that for selected reaction monitoring, but mainly for um, um, 
um, targeted analysis, it will be good to make use of uh, Q-trap or triple quad kasi meron kang capabilities for multiple reaction monitoring. And this is very helpful if you're dealing with very complex samples such as um, blood or plasma, uh, etc. So these are just some considerations in terms of like running your LCMS um, analysis. Um, usually, column diameters are 2.1 to 3 uh, millimeters high throughput. You can employ 30 to 50 millimeter long columns. For complex mixtures, you might need a longer column such as 100 or 150 millimeter length. Uh, again, mobile phase has to be volatile. Um, flow rates has to be within the limits of the mass spec. Um, and uh, you have to choose the suitable ion source for your analyte of interest, as well as the suitable mass spec for your um, analytes. And the um, desolvation temperature, it varies with also flow rate. So depend the um, higher flow rate will require higher desolvation temperature. But you cannot set it too high kasi pwede niya ma-fragment yung uh, molecules mo. And this is your in-source fragmentation. Uh, so this is just to illustrate kung ano yung difference between targeted and untargeted LCMS or GCMS analysis. So again, untargeted, uh, mainly exploratory, you make use of high resolution mass spec. Usually you acquire um, scan acquisition mode so you can obtain um, something such as this wherein you have a whole um, slew of different peaks or different metabolites present. If you're looking at targeted, you make use of like targeted um, acquisition modes such as multiple reaction monitoring or your or if you're looking at uh, specific classes of compounds, you can make use of precursor ion, product ion, or neutral loss scans. Um, this is just to illustrate um, the workflow that I have used in a previous study. So you can uh, have your plasma sample subject it to protein precipitation. Um, and then from the supernatant, you can get alicotes for both uh, helic LCMS and reverse phase LCMS. If you are um, doing the analysis at a different time, then you can do the, um, drying of your extracts uh, and then just reconstitute it just before the analysis. Uh, the same plasma sample has been subjected to NMR analysis just with the addition of a saline 10% D2O with the internal standard DSS and subjected to 500 megahertz uh, proton NMR. Okay, so some important considerations when do working with uh, mass spec-based metabolomics. Uh, first is randomization of your samples, um, analysis of uh, blanks, uh, such as your extraction, reconstitution, and mobile phase in case there are any contaminants in any part of your um, uh, experimental procedure, then you will be able to determine that or get to know of that by uh, uh, the analysis of your blanks. If possible, best to run all samples for an experiment in one con continuous run in order to avoid batch effects and uh, make use of quality control samples. So this is um, how you prepare quality control samples. Uh, if you have um, different study samples, you can pull them together and from there, create small alic codes that will be subjected to the same um, um, steps of preparation and analysis, such as your samples. This is usually um, analyzed at the start of your uh, run uh, for equilibration of your column with your matrix. And also, it can be analyzed every five or 10 samples to serve as yun nga, quality control. In case anything happens within a particular batch of samples, then you will immediately know from your quality control samples. So that's it for today. I'm sorry, I have I have like uh, extended quite a lot, but I hope you have learned uh, a lot from this session. Um, we'll talk up more about the data processing as well as the subse subsequent steps in our next session in March 19, Chemometrics in Metabolomics. So again, this is a three-part seminar. I, uh, we're looking forward to the uh, presentation of Dr. Mel later. And of course, uh, in the next session, uh, uh, Dr. Rod Sumaya will be joining me uh, for the third installment of this webinar series. So acknowledgement, again, much thanks to the OST, PSC, RCRD, and the Balik Scientist Program. Uh, the De La Salle University Manila, Prof. Drexel Camacho, the DLSU CIF staff or is also uh, very uh, much involved. Uh, there are the, the 
the people behind this webinar series, um, Dr. Fekaling Ashon, Dr. Mel Garcia, and Dr. Rod Smaya for joining us in this webinar series, National University Singapore of Singapore and its chemistry Depar department who provided me with the scholarship when I was in uh, for my PhD. Um, Prof. Sam Lee and this research group members uh, who has been of great support throughout my research journey um, um, in Singapore. The NUS Environmental Research Institute staff, researchers, and management was also been of great help and support throughout my journey. Applications, I, I would like to give a special shout out to application and product specialists, sales executives, and service engineers of different instrument and consumable manufacturers. Um, I, I thank you for their generosity in terms of the help, the support, the assistance they have given me uh, in maintaining our instruments as well as in helping me get my research work done uh, by providing the support and uh, the products that I need. Of course, much thanks to my family and friends for, again, all, the always ever constant support and encouragement. Um, and again, pray all praise and thanks be to God for this opportunity. So that's all folks. If you have any questions, if you want to explore the use of metabolomics in your analysis, my contact details are here. So please do let me know. So that's all again. Thank you.